Hello and welcome to Graduate Theory. Uh, in today's episode, it's just you and me. We're doing a deep dive into work life balance. Now, work life balance in 2021. April 2021, Google tweeted that work-life balance um, hit its peak in in terms of search, in terms of the trend. So Google Trends, work-life balance uh, hit a peak 2021. uh, In April of 2021, it it had never been searched more than it had been at that time. It is a topical problem. People are struggling to find the balance between work and life. How do I manage these things? And then... uh, and how do I live in harmony, perhaps, in both my work and my life? Work-life balance, I guess, is this dichotomy between how much sp- how much time do we spend at work and how much time do we spend uh, in our life or not doing work? And what is the kind of split that we choose for this? So if you were sort of 100% on work, imagine, you know, you worked, you literally worked all the time. There was no life, uh, then things would get, uh, probably it wouldn't be the happiest, the balance isn't quite there. But And so maybe you want to have dinner with your family some nights of the week. Maybe it's maybe it's a one night a week, you know, uh, and we spend less time at work. Two nights a week, even less work. Three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, seven nights a week, less work. So, uh, and then you can even dial this further and say, maybe I should spend 50-50 work and non-work. You know, and, and this question of work-life balance really is what is the optimal split between work and life? And how can you divide these two areas up in a way that uh, means that you are, uh, like, it makes you the happiest that you can be, right? Because uh, I guess that is the underlying assumption is if, you're, if your work-life balance is off, then you will be unhappy, uh, unfulfilled, uh, all of these kinds of things. Uh, I've even seen through my research for this episode that work-life balance can be something that you actually achieve. So people will ask on forums, you know, how like how do I achieve work-life balance? Or they'll ask a particular person, how did you achieve work-life balance? And and this is interesting to me because can you actually achieve work-life balance? Probably not. I would say it's more of a thing that's in flux all the time. It's 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 this delicate dance right between work and life, uh, and as we'll see later, perhaps these things are actually more related. Perhaps, perhaps there's actually not much of a divide between these two things at all. Anyway, in today's episode, we're going to take a look at this stuff in more detail, um, and I'm going to start with a personal story, something that I think is relevant to this topic, and from there we'll kind of dive in to the details and hear from different people, hear what they've got to say. Uh, Today's episode, we're going to hear from someone like uh, Jeff Bezos. We're going to hear from Brian Tracy, Ted Talks, a previous podcast guest, Simon Sinek. All these people are going to be featured in this episode. So super exciting. Um, um, Yeah, I think this is an interesting topic. It's something that I think we, uh, there are some parts of this that we need to talk about more. So let's do it. I want to start off with a personal story about work-life balance and and something that happened to me a few months ago and something that I think is a good starting point for this kind of work-life balance conversation. So it it was a few months ago at work and I was just doing my thing, got, um, had a chat with my manager and he assigned me to do this piece of work that I was quite excited by. Uh, I was like, this is really cool. I'm super excited to take on this thing and see what I can do with it. So the day I got given this piece of work, I was really excited. I went, I went and did heaps of work on it, and then the end of the workday came, and I was at the office, and then I went home, uh, and and you know had some dinner and whatever, and then after the dinner, I was like, you know, I'm still thinking about this problem. Why don't I just keep working on it? And so that's what I did. I got my laptop back out, and you know it was like seven o'clock at night or whatever. I started doing more work, uh, and you know worked until nine thirty or whatever, and, th- and then it was time for bed. Uh, and, and then I went to bed and, and uh, you know, then, then on the weekend, uh, I did even more. So then I was like, well, I'm still thinking about this problem. I'm really enjoying it. It's really sort of stretching me. I feel like I'm gaining a lot of, a, a lot out of this. Uh, you know, let's just keep going. <laughs> so, so I, I did even more. Um, and, and, you know, that was, it was really fun. I, I really enjoyed it. The project like went really well and I learned heaps from doing it. Um, but the, the problems for me, 
came from when I went to tell other people about this and I went and, and said to them, um, you know, firstly, I told my, uh, my manager was like, how did you do all this work over the, <laughs> when I only gave you this big task on Friday? Uh, and I was like, well, yeah, I did do some work over the weekend. And he, and, and he said, well, this is good, but you know, probably best to not get in the habit of doing this because, you know, we, like you need some, you need some life, right? We need to keep the work-life balance split here make sure that you know work doesn't take over too much of things because otherwise we'll, we'll, we'll burn out perhaps um but on the other hand it's it's exciting that you uh, wanted to do this and it wasn't something that was expected and just making he, he made sure that this wasn't so sort of the expectation <laughs> that i go and do extra stuff on the weekend which i absolutely uh, knew um so that was a good interesting conversation and then another separate conversation came when i was telling friends about what I did on the weekend <laughs> and and I say to them, this is what I did on the weekend. I actually had this really fun project at work uh, and I just decided to work on that on the weekend. Uh, and everyone there is like, what? Like, why are you working on the, at the, like on this piece of work, at the, you know, on the weekend, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, you know, what about your work-life balance? <laughs> you know, things like this. Uh, in my head, I'm like, yeah, I sort of see what you mean. Like, I probably could have done other things, but like there was nothing really that I prefer, would prefer to do at that time other than work on this thing. Uh, like this thing was genuinely exciting me uh, and it was super cool. And so I'm glad I did it. But there was kind of this weird, <laughs> I don't know, people thought it was very strange that someone could enjoy work that much that they would uh, choose to do it outside of work hours, um, which I thought was interesting. And so... That's the end of the story. And it's an interesting story. It's something that I think about reasonably often, but today's episode is a good chance to dive into a lot of this content in more detail. And so I've got two different uh, things that I think we can split this story and work-life balance generally into two sort of sub problems, I would call them, for work-life balance. And one of these is a work-life balance problem where work is interrupting important things um, basically when you're forced to work more than you would like. And then the second problem is people who work lots are sort of seem to be a bit strange because they don't have work-life balance. And this is a work-life balance problem. And so this would be work-life balance when you're not forced to work. And so when you're actually choosing to do it, and then there's, there's this more, more of a, a cultural, um, a problem perhaps <laughs> that you, that you have to face. Right. Uh, and so I want to split it into these two and we'll, dive into these in more detail. So the first one is when work is interrupting important things. And an example, I guess a classic <laughs> example of this would be the case where the husband is at the hospital and his wife is giving birth to a tr to their child and he's there, it's, it's all going really well. And then he gets a phone call from a client and and, and goes <laughs> and has to take the call and he can't be there with his kid and uh, he can't be there for this incredible moment where, you know, his wife is needs him there. Uh, but no, I have to sort of skip this because the client is, is calling me, uh, you know, so that would perhaps be an example where the expectation of working is, is, is clearly subtracting from your experience of life. Uh, and and when when work is interrupting important things, and so there's maybe, and so there is versions of this that are more tame. That's an extreme example, but things where you're trying to have dinner with your family, and and the client calls, and you're expected to go and respond, or you're expected to go do this and that outside of work hours to the point where it's interrupting the things you'd want to do, uh, you know, to the point where it's frustrating you. And so today. I'm not going to be the one giving advice for this uh, <laughs> because I've found people who are more smarter than me and better <laughs> than me at explaining different things. And so these people are going to give you some advice. So we've got firstly a TED talk uh, where we're going to hear three rules to create a better work life balance. And secondly, we're going to hear from Brian Tracy. Brian Tracy is very famous self development coach figure. Uh, and he has some really good advice for creating, uh, you know, for turning your office life, optimizing it so that you can have better work life balance. But here's those tips now. For so many of us, myself included, our days feel filled with a million small interruptions. 
And this is true even of our days off. Maybe you've taken a call at the beach, texted your boss from the grocery store, or emailed a colleague while on a picnic with your family. We've convinced ourselves that these behaviors are no big deal. It's just one email. But there's a real cost to these interruptions, and there are smart strategies we can all take to better protect our time. These moments seem so small at the time, and yet research suggests they add up to a tremendous loss. The constant creep of work into our personal lives can increase our stress and undermine our happiness. So just what is the cost? In one study, researchers recruited parents who were visiting a science museum with their kids. Some parents were told to check their phone as much as possible, others were told to check their phone as little as possible. After the visit, parents who used their phones reported that the experience was significantly less meaningful. They also felt much lonelier. In another study, tourists who were asked to have their phones out while visiting an iconic church remembered fewer details a week later. And in my research, employees who were paid for their performance spent increasingly less time interacting with friends and family, and more and more time interacting with colleagues and clients. These constant interruptions come at a cost to organizations too. Companies lose 32 days of productivity each year to employee depression, which is often caused by the stress and burnout of our always-on culture. Despite knowing better, I too have found myself focusing on urgent work distractions over important life moments. Most recently, I found myself texting a client while in the middle of my first child's first ultrasound. Happy client, guilty mom-to-be. When you add up all of these moments, the sum total is a life shortchanged on meaning, joy, connection, and even memory. As we remake our models of work in the wake of the pandemic, now is our opportunity to create a new culture that respects time. And the way to make this really big change is through small steps that we can take right now. The first step that we need to take is to reframe rest. Reflect for a moment about what you think about when you hear the word rest. Sounds amazing, right? But in my mind, I immediately worry about not being productive enough or letting down my colleagues. When we do have time off, we need to find ways in which we can enjoy the present moment and savor the leisure time that we have available, as opposed to seeing it as an unproductive barrier to our work. One specific strategy we can take is to treat our upcoming weekend like a vacation. On Friday afternoon, jot down how you would act and behave as if you were on a holiday. Maybe you and your partner will buy a bottle of wine and watch online clips of the Eiffel Tower. Maybe you'll visit a local cafe and listen to some live music. Or maybe you'll go for a long walk in the middle of the day with no phone and no agenda. The plan doesn't have to be expensive or extravagant. Another strategy you can take is to create clear boundaries for your time off. Instead of saying, I'm out of the office, feel free to slack me whenever. Say, I'll be offline. Call me only if it's urgent. To uphold these personal goals, work together as a team. Set team goals for personal time. Do it publicly, collect data, and hold each other accountable. These goals could sound like, I will not check email between 6 and 8 p.m., I will have dinner with my family four nights a week, or I will go for a jog midday. Check in on your team's progress and see how everyone's doing. If you or your teammates are unsuccessful, work together to help accomplish personal goals. Lastly, you can negotiate for more time to prevent work from creeping into your personal life. In business school, I teach students to negotiate for salary, but realize I spoke almost nothing about negotiating for more time. What does this look like in practice? You can ask for more time on adjustable deadlines at work. If your client asks for a deliverable Monday morning, ask for an extension until Tuesday afternoon so you don't find yourself working on your well-deserved weekend. And don't worry too much about reputation. Quality truly is the metric that matters most. In my data, employees who proactively asked for more time reported lower levels of stress and burnout and were seen as more committed and professional by their colleagues. These are small but powerful changes to not only reframe rest, but to reclaim it. Once you discover the profound impact that these changes can have, you'll feel empowered to demand that others respect and accommodate your approach to time. 
maybe they'll even feel inspired to piece together the fractured moments of their lives too. Hello, I'm Brian Tracy, and today we're going to talk about a big subject, one that everyone seems to struggle with, and it's called work-life balance. The first thing to understand about work-life balance is that most people have the wrong idea of what that actually means. They think that their whole life should be balanced. They think they should have a little bit of work and a little bit of play and a little bit of time on the weekends in order to improve the quality of their lives. When thinking about your quality of life, you have to ask yourself, what do you really want to do with your life? The great question. So here are four tips for time management that will help you to achieve a work-life balance and improve your quality of life. Number one, use the power of positive affirmations. Positive affirmations, or what they call positive self-talk, are commands that you pass from your conscious mind to your subconscious mind that you either say out loud or say to yourself with emotion and enthusiasm to drive the words into your subconscious mind, sort of like a pile driver. It's sort of like instructing yourself to follow new operating instructions. Begin by repeating positive affirmations over and over to yourself, such as, I am excellent at time management, I am excellent at time management, or I already have a balanced work and life. My favorite time management affirmation is, I use my time well, I use my time well, I use my time well. Just say that over and over. When you repeat positive affirmations over and over, they are eventually accepted by your subconscious mind as commands, just like you've programmed it. And then you'll find that your external behaviors on the outside will start to reflect your new internal programming. We say, as within, so without. Now, tip number two in managing your time and achieving work-life balance, if there is such a thing, is to visualize your time management skills. Mental pictures almost immediately influence your subconscious mind. So begin to see yourself as well organized and efficient and effective in time management. We say mentally fake it before you make it. So recall and recreate memories and pictures of yourself when you were performing at your best and getting through enormous amounts of work. Through positive affirmations, you can create a picture of the upcoming event and see it unfolding perfectly in every respect. See yourself as calm, positive, happy, and in complete control. See the other people doing and saying exactly what you would want them to do if the situation was perfect. Play this picture of yourself over and over again on the screen of your mind. Tip number three is take action based on your visualizations. Now that you have concentrated on and visualized what your day and your future will look like with proper time management, it's time for you to put it into action. You do this by working the entire time you're at work. When you walk into the office, you should work the entire time you're there. Be pleasant and friendly to your coworkers, but Get to work right away and work until you are finished. Peter Drucker says that if you spend more than 10% of your time socializing, your time is out of control. Now by doing this, going straight to work, you'll get on top of your work and will walk away feeling accomplished at the end of your day. When you don't have lingering tasks to worry about, since you'll have worked as hard as you could have during your time in the office, you'll be left with plenty of quality time to spend with your friends and family. Super interesting hearing those tips there. I think one thing for me in facing this problem is like, is having the boundaries there, right? We need to develop boundaries around when is work time and when is not work time. Uh, and I think if you, if you say, okay, my work hours are nine to five, and then if I can't achieve the things that uh, I'm being expected to achieve in that time, then I say to them, hey, I'm currently occupied uh, or, or my plate is currently full. If you'd like me to take on this additional thing, then I'll need to subtract from the things that are already on my plate. Uh, and so that way you can keep the nine to five 
uh, you, or whatever your work hours are. You can keep your work hours where they need to be. And so let, let's say you're really busy, you've got a few things on, um, and then someone comes to you and is like, James, you know, I really want you to work on this project as well. Uh, and you say, and you, when you're thinking in your head, okay, if I take this on, I don't really have enough time. <laughs> and so like, that's going to make me very stressed. And if I take this on, I'm probably going to have to work more. I don't really want to do that. And how do I say no to this person? I can't just be like, no, I don't want to, I, I can't, I don't have time to work on your thing. Um, so there, there, perhaps a better way of going about this is saying, hey, thanks so much for thinking of me uh, with this piece of work. Looks super exciting. Um, I'd love to work on it. But at the moment, my plate is currently full. I've got this, this, and this that I'm currently working on. At the, at the moment, I don't have, I, I won't be able to get the project that you're saying done uh, in, 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 the, in the right time frame or with the suitable quality. Uh, so is it, if, if I'm going to take this on, is there anything that you think uh, I, should, I can take off my plate, you know, to be able to take this on and do it well instead? So some type of conversation like that to be had around like, like that. When it comes to boundaries, I think that is going to, uh, you know, that, that's quite important in protecting yourself from this kind of seat that that can happen where work just kind of the, the hours extend 10 minutes and then 10 10 10 and it just kind of keeps on going and then before you know it you're working sort of seven to seven <laughs> perhaps uh, and you know things and, and and that's not where you want to be and, it's, and so it, it's different like we're going to talk about next if that is something you actually want to do is work a seven to seven or whatever the hours that you want to work are uh, you know it's different if that's not what you want to do, but if it is what you want to do, then we face a different problem, which brings us to part two. So part two, as I mentioned right at the start, was we kind of have this split between when work-life balance, when you're forced to work outside, and then when you're not forced to work. And so now we're going to talk about when you're not forced to work, and this interesting idea uh, that we as a society, we as a culture have that work-life balance is uh, means that you know people that work a long time have kind of got it wrong uh, you know that their their work life balance is taking a hit that you know they they might be working lots but oh I, th- th- their work life balance must suck and it's almost like this uh people who work lots are seen as uh, you know bad <laughs> in some ways right because they're working they're working so much and it's like well you know how can why, why would you choose to work that's kind of weird uh i try and work as most people work as little as possible. Choosing to work more is is kind of strange. So this one is more for those people <laughs> that choose to work more. And, and here's some interesting thoughts perhaps about how work-life balance isn't perhaps what it sounds like, right? That work and life are perhaps the same thing. You know, work and life are perhaps in, in harmony together is what we'll get to in a sec. So now we're going to hear from Jeff Bezos and we're going to hear from some other people about work-life balance. Here we go. How do you go about establishing that work-life balance that everybody, you know, talks about and thinks about? You've got, I mean, you live a big life, right? And how do you, how do you I get this question a lot. I get it. I teach um, senior executive uh, kind of, leadership classes at Amazon for our most senior uh, uh, execs. And I also teach, or not teach, but I also speak to um, interns. So kind of all across the spectrum. And I get this question about work-life balance all the time from from both ends of the spectrum. And the, my view is I don't even like the phrase work-life balance. I think it's misleading. I like the phrase work-life harmony. Because I know that if I am energized at work, happy at work, feeling like I'm adding value, um, part of a team, whatever energizes you, that makes me better at home. It makes me a better husband, a better father. And likewise, if I'm happy at home, it makes me a better employee, a better boss, all the things... It's not about, it's not primarily about, there may be crunch periods where it's about the number of hours in the week, but that, that's, not the, that's not the real thing. Usually it's about, do you have energy? And is, the, is your work 
depriving you of energy or is your work generating energy for you? And you know, there are people, everybody in this room knows people you, who fall into these two camps. You're in a meeting and the person comes in the room. Some people come into the meeting and they add energy to the meeting. Other people come into the meeting and the whole meeting just deflates. And those people just, they, they, they drain energy from the meeting. And you have to decide which of those kinds of people you're going to be. Are you going to add energy? Um, and the uh, same thing at home. And the same thing at home. And it's a, so it's a wheel. It's a cycle. It's a flywheel. It's a circle. It's not a balance. Because a balance, that's why that metaphor is so dangerous. Because it implies there's a strict trade-off. And um, you could be out of work, have all the time for your family in the world, but really depressed and demoralized about your work situation, and your family wouldn't want to be anywhere near you. They would wish you would take a vacation from them. And so it's not about the number of hours, not primarily. I suppose if you went crazy with, you know, 100 hours a week or something, yeah, that maybe, right. maybe there are limits. And they probably, but I've never had a problem, um, and I think it's because both sides of my life give me energy. And, and I, I, that's what I would recommend. That's what I do recommend to interns and execs. So, James, when you say do something for your employer, can you think of examples where you do something which is only for your employer? In other words, you have personally nothing invested at all. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'd say, yeah, it's a good point. And I think even if it's, I'm just thinking of like a basic task, like sending some emails or things like that. You're still, it's still a mutually beneficial relationship in that, like they're paying you to do that so that there's something in it for you in that sense. But even in terms of a career progression way of looking at it, I guess there's always in the things that you do, it's still driving your career forward and maybe make you more, able would be employed or uh, do other things for other people. So I guess there's growing your skill set is, is also something that. Hold it's on. beneficial to yourself as well. Yeah, that, that was one of the words I was hoping you would get to, just to get the money for a while. But yeah, it, even things like a simple email has the potential to develop you around knowledge, skills, and value. Every interaction, if you think of it that way. So mm -hmm. coming back to my response to you, in a funny sort of way, I don't see any more work-life balance. Because as I've had more time to read and think since I retired from the partnership in 2008, I now see work very much as what you do whilst you waiting for the real joys in your life. And once you are in that space, I promise you, you will never think of it as work again. When you are largely, I won't say hundred percent, I don't want to go overboard, but when you are largely of the thought that I really love doing this stuff. Yeah. This is me. Mm -hmm. I love the people that I'm with. Yeah. I love the opportunities that it's giving me to develop as a human being. Yeah. It makes me return to my family every day, a really decent human being. Mm -hmm. I no longer have any notions of leaving the work at the front door. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Something to and it, strive for every day. And it's not mm -hmm. easy. It's bloody hard because there's so much in life that competes with our attainment of that space. And I could start to talk about some of the awful challenges that your generation has about lifestyle and you know, getting the sort of money that enables you to live in a particular way and then being locked in yourselves and those closest to you about, you know, Whatever else I do in life, I need a job that returns me a minimum of X dollars every month. And when young, when young lawyers, picks up your point, Peter, which has got a lot of honesty to it. When young lawyers from big law firms come to me and say, almost as an admission of failure, 
this isn't really for me. And I don't know how to tell my parents. I've got a, I've got a job in the M&A department at Reels or DLA Piper or something. And I hate it. I absolutely hate it. Yeah. And I say to them, how important is money to you? Because if money is not terribly important to you as a lawyer, the world's your oyster. Yeah. But if the first thing you have to do is get a tick on not less than a hundred thousand dollars a year or two hundred thousand dollars a year or being on that slippery ladder to partnership, all of that stuff, if all of that's there, then there's a all you've done is closed off a huge number of options. It may very well include your authentic self. So I am uncomfortable with this concept of work-life balance um, because balance is achieved with two opposing forces. And why should work and life be in opposition, right? And uh, I, I don't think there's, if you don't have work-life balance, if you're struggling to find work-life balance, no amount of yoga will fix that, right? Um, taking off an extra week of vacation, and by the way, vacation means you're not working on the beach. That's just telecommuting from a beach. Um, um, but I believe in, in uh, that, the, that you're able to build a life where work and personal life become, uh, not I want to say interchangeable, but smooth. And what I mean by that is they're not necessarily confined by hours in a day, but rather where I choose to give effort. So for example, if it's four o'clock in the afternoon, technically part of the work day, and you're hankering for a run because it's a day like this, you can go for a run. Like, that's, you know? And one of, the th one of the mistakes that I've made was treating things that are important to my mind, my body, my spirit, as stump something that I'm suppo only supposed to do off hours or on weekends. Sure. But just like I can't decide when I have an idea, sometimes it's on Saturday and sometimes it's in the evening, mm -hmm. I also can't decide when I need a break. Sometimes it's something I feel, not something I plan for. And so, We've gotten really good. It's imperfect. You know, sometimes responsibility takes precedence. But we have gotten really good in our little company that if somebody wants to take an afternoon to be with their kids, they put in their calendar with my kids. Mm -hmm. I, a long time ago, I used to have, when I, when I had um, a different form of a business before all of this stuff, we used to have things called duvet days, which I, I, get, I can't remember. We had like five duvet days a year or something. And a duvet day was... You wake up in the morning, you just don't want to come to work. You're totally healthy. Or it's a beautiful day and I just would rather go to the beach. So you'd call up and leave a message at 8 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning and be like, hey, I'm taking a duvet day, I'll see you tomorrow. And no one would bother you, right? And people are like, that's amazing that you do that, Simon. I'm like, people are doing that anyway. It's called, <coughs> hey, I think I have a 24-hour bug. I'm not going to be at work today. And they go to the beach. So just call it out. Um, you know, schedule time at the gym in the middle of the day if that's when you like working out. And I just found the, the more seamless that we can make work and life, um, the more we start to enjoy both more because they're not, they're not opposing. Some great insights there. And I love the Bezos piece about work-life harmony and about how, you know, working can make you feel better which makes you a better person at home which makes you better at work and it's kind of this flywheel where all these things are benefiting the other uh, I, I found a great tweet alex hamozi who's a business mogul uh, <laughs> offers a lot of great advice online and here's his tweet he said work-life balance assumes you're not living when you work in my experience it's been the opposite when i work i live and i think that's a super uh, fantastic tweet and and something that you know that we that, that i guess those of us that want to that want to work more and pursue things and, and work harder and achieve etc you know these things are not things to be ashamed of like choosing to work extra on the weekend is not something to be you know you don't have something wrong with you if that's something you want to do right if it's something that you want to do then you should do it okay uh, and don't let the, the the chains of your friendship groups society etc hold you back from the things that you want to do the things that you want to achieve um 
Cool. Well, well, that brings us to the end of the episode today. This one was an interesting episode. I think we covered some good ground when it comes to work-life balance. It's an interesting conundrum is this idea of how much time should we spend on work and life. But I think what I've learned is that work and life are not distinct things. They are related. They have, they have harmony between, the, between them and that working better and, and, and doing work that gives you energy will make you better at your life, will make you feel better at life, which will make you, you know, and once you enjoy that, that, that life side of things, uh, that will make you better and make you enjoy your work more, which will make you enjoy your life more, etc. And I think, I think these are some great points. So yeah, hopefully this episode was useful for you, the listener. If you did enjoy this episode, please consider subscribing to the Graduate Theory newsletter. It comes out every single week. We've got many episodes lined up for you. So please do that. And yeah, thanks again for joining us in this episode. Looking forward to seeing you next week.